Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? Well, hopefully you guys are enjoying that now we're plowing through the Jeremiah playlist. Some of the videos are going to be a little shorter than others, but they're not going to be any less... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> any less interesting. Um, and like uh, David... Uh, uh, I've been telling you guys about Dr. David Macrath and what he's been doing in the UK and he actually watched the one Jeremiah video and commented on it and he said uh, verse 2 for Jeremiah 10 jumped out at him and we went back in the pre well, in the video you're going to see today we go, I think we go back and cover that and I show you what it said and, and we talk about it for a minute but um, especially the books in the Old Testament need to be taken off the ignore list okay we read those there's nothing else we can glean from those there's a lot we can glean through from those if you want to get you know get rid of get your eyes open go watch the the zachariah or not zachariah ecclesiastes playlist i did especially and i recommend all the videos because there's a lot in there but especially episode 12 we make a kind of interesting discovery in ecclesiastes 12 now i don't know if that's what that is but it sure sounds like it pretty interesting um, these books in the Old Testament have a lot to teach us. And all of this stuff was given to us to help us understand what's going on in the New Testament. You can look and see how many times the guys in the New Testament, including Christ, quote the Old Testament. Well, that gives validity to it and says that it's there for a reason and it's something that we need to pay attention to. It helps us understand uh, how God does things. It helps us understand how the people do things. It helps us see the mistakes that they were making, like Jeremiah is showing us, so that we don't make them now. Because human beings are horrible about forgetting history. And when they forget history, they're doomed to repeat it. There's, just, there's a saying about, about that. So it's important for us to go back into these old books and read them again. And I think that's why I've been inspired several times to go back and do them. I have a playlist on all the small books of the Bible. I think I did all the books... I think it was all the books with three chapters or less. And there's a lot of stuff in them. Some of them in three chapters have an... Some of them in one chapter have an incredible amount of information. And they're worthy of our attention. So that's why I'm doing this. I'm hoping you guys are getting something out of it. This morning I want to talk about doing what's right. Do what's right. Always do what's right. And this is a, a interesting topic because you have to discern what's right. Well, how do we know what's right? As Christians, as believers in Christ and in God, how do we know what's right? Well, we know what's right because God's word tells us what's right. Guys, this is right, this is wrong. If you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. And that's what God says. Stay away from these things. It leads to bad stuff. Stay with these things. It leads to good stuff. And when we do what's right, it keeps us aligned on that narrow path. Now, are we always going to do what's right? Well, no. But sometimes there may be circumstances surrounding that. There's a lot of detail that goes on in, on in this. Sometimes what's the right thing to do for one person isn't the right thing to do for another person. See, God knows this. This is what's so unique about salvation in Christ is that each individual person, God works with that individual person on his level. Now, there are standards that God puts down. These are the standards. But there are some things that he works with the individual on because of where they're living, where they were saved, lifestyle, economy, society. All that stuff can play a factor in how he works with that individual. But every single person that is called by his name will be brought into redemption. Every one of us will be brought to the same place. We just may take a lot of different paths to get to that first, that narrow path. Some people will use that as an excuse, unfortunately, to do what they want to do. You can't do what you want to do and expect to do the will of God. Because the will of God isn't my will. His will is his will. My will is my will. When I do what I want to do, I'm going against the will of God. How do we know what the will of God is in our lives? Easy. Read the Bible. It tells you this is the will of God. Do a word search. Do a word search. Will of God or will or God's will. And look and see what the scriptures say. We might do that tomorrow. I don't know. See how the Lord leads on that. But that's how you find out what his will is. What does he want me to do? 
Then, when you look at what God's will is in the Bible, you go into prayer. Lord, what is your will for my life and what I'm doing here? What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? And then you wait on the Lord. Now, I'm still, I still have an open prayer with him concerning that. Lord, what do you want me to do? What is your will for me right now for me to do? Right now, it's this. It's what I'm doing right here, and it's what I've been doing for, um, we're creeping up on three years. Doesn't even seem like it's been three years at all. <laughs> but I have it, I have it open because I, I, in the last time I prayed about this, I, I said, Lord, I want to do what you want me to do. But there's a lot of times where I'm dense and I'm not paying attention and I don't know what that is or I don't recognize when you're telling me. So please make it obvious to me so that I can see it and then I can do it. Make me to serve you. And I said, and I will wait on you until, until such time as you answer. If he never answers, then I'm doing exactly what he wanted me to do. If he answers, then there's something I need to make a change in. And then we go forward in that. And that's the big difference between a believer and an, and an, un, and an unbeliever. Or even a believer in someone who's rebellious. It's not just about doing what's right. It's doing what God wants us to do. A believer wants to do what God wants them to do. Now, sometimes he doesn't tell us what he wants us to do right away. Sometimes it takes a little while. He has to prepare us to move in that direction. When we're ready, he does it and we do it. But the others, they don't care. And when you tell them, they usually respond very violently about it. So what they do is they do their own thing and try to make it godly. Trying to self-justify. We can't do that. Now, again, are we going to be perfect in it? Absolutely not. I'm not perfect at all. I don't do this perfectly. I don't do anything perfectly. But we do the best we can with what we have and how we know to do it. And we hope and pray that God's going to take it and change it and make it for something good. Doesn't the Bible say he he makes all things to work for those who, uh, who he loves? Pretty simple. 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's not going to cleanse us instantaneously. This is a misunderstanding. He cleanses us through the process of sanctification. That's what sanctification is, a cleansing. We're being sanctified to the day of redemption. On the day of redemption, he will finish the work he started in all of us. He will finish the work he started in everybody who's died in Christ over the last 2,000 years. You can see that work isn't finished yet. That's the new body of redemption that we get. The beam of seat judgment, the finished work. James 4, 17, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. James makes this abundantly clear. If you know what the right thing is to do and you don't do it, that has become a sin. Because you did the opposite of what was right. Now, if you didn't know what the right thing was to do, that's a little different. He works with you on that. He shows you that. Because we have the ability of free will. We can choose not to do the right thing. We do it every day. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. You know, that, that mentality has gotten me in more trouble. Because, and I, I can remember this as back, far back as when I first started to work. My dad always taught a, a, me to have a good work ethic. But I always seemed to have some, I don't know, it seemed like I wanted to go further with it. And so I would always go out there and challenge myself and always go faster and always do better and always make it better or, or something. Always trying to one-up myself. And there was always this thing that I had this thing in me. And I, I had, at that time, when I was young, I never read the Bible. But I always had this thing that, that I, I, I'm doing this for someone else. So I'm going to do it the best that I can. And I got myself in more trouble doing that. Because what happened was other people didn't have that mentality. And so in their eyes, I was making them look bad. In their eyes, I was pushing them, making them go faster. In their eyes, I was trying to show off. No, I'm just trying to do my job. Even when I was at my church, I was told that I was trying to show off. No, I'm just doing what I know to do. I saw a situation, tried to help fix it. Went down there and hung drywall six hours by myself one day. 
in the in a bathroom house. And when all the people they had in that church and none of them could come together long enough to do it. Okay, I went down and did it by myself. I had nothing to do with showing off. It needed to be done. I, I had the ability to do it. But I've gotten to the point in my life now where he's given me something to slow me down. And I don't fully understand why, but this disease slows me down. I have to be very picky and selective about what I do. Because there's going to be a lot of pain that comes with it. I learned my lesson that day after six hours because it took me a month to recover from it. I was walking with a cane the next day. <clears throat> but when we do something, we're told, do it like we're doing it for the Lord. Take the time to do it right. Make sure we don't cut any corners. Make sure we do it to the best of our ability. Now, some, some abilities might be different than others. Just think about that. The best of our ability. When your heart is in the right place in these things, even if you can't actually get it 100% right with your hands, when your heart is in the right place, that's what matters that's what makes the difference whatever you do work heartily as for the lord and not for men because what people do for men may be completely different than what they do for the lord colossians three seventeen, and whatever you do in word or deed do everything in the name of the lord jesus giving thanks to god the father through him everything that we do should be in the name of the lord Everything we do should be, we should have the thoughts of the Lord on our hearts while we're doing them. How would the, what would the Lord think about how this looks? And, and what would he think about me doing this? What would he think about me doing that? Because there may be some things that we're doing that we realize, oh, I don't think the Lord would really like that very much. I think I'm going to stop doing that. John 3, 16, of course. And I, again, I think there should be other, the other verses should be a, a sign of this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I actually want to go to John three sixteen. Oops, that's the wrong one. It's actually better when you read John 3.16 to read the next couple of verses. John 3.16 is great by itself, but these other verses help it. Verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are were evil because their deeds were evil. They didn't do what was right. They did what was wrong. Now, what's really good is keep reading. This is what's great about context. Keep reading. Look at what else he says. Verse 20, For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. Is this not exactly in line with what we're talking about today? Do what's right, your deeds. Your deeds will become exposed. Verse 21, but he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. See, John 3.16 is great by itself, but you really need to read the rest of these because these all go into the context. And it, it directly relates to what we're talking about here. The things that we do every day are everyday things. Are they done for our benefit, for someone else's benefit, or for God's benefit? You can take any activity. Well, I say any, but you let me let me make sure I explain this properly. You can take any activity that you do every day and make it something done for God. That being said, when you try to do that, some activities you're going to be like, I can't make this something that will glorify God, so I can't do this activity. If you take everything that you do and say, how can I make this something that I can do for God? You'll realize it's a wasted effort. I have things that I do that are wasted efforts. That doesn't glorify God. 
trip to the store doesn't glorify God unless I meet someone I can share the gospel with. Unless I meet somebody that I can bless, then it's something that glorifies God. There's a whole lot of things we do every day that don't glorify God. It's a balancing act. But in everything, do we do what's right. Do what the right thing is to do. Everybody else around here, they speed like crazy. I do the speed limit. It's the right thing to do. It, that's what we're. That's why there's a speed limit. Now, the people are like, well, it's okay to go a little over. Okay, I'll get, I can give you a couple mile an hour. I, sometimes I do that just to keep up with traffic. But I set the cruise control and I do the speed limit. It's the right thing to do. Do the speed limit. Drive like you're supposed to drive. Stay off your phone. So many people, I see them with their phone in their hand. It's like you can Bluetooth it to your stereo. Every car has this ability. That's the, one of the first things I do when we, when we get a vehicle. When we bought my wife's truck, we're leaving the dealership syncing phones. Sync them to the stereo. Hands-free all day long. <laughs> when we do what's right we align ourselves with what God would want us to do and it could be a random thing when we do what's wrong consequently on the other side of the coin we separate ourselves from what God would do when we do what's right, we're aligning with his will. When we do what's wrong, we're separating from his will. When we do what's right, we're aligning with what he wants us to do. When we do what's wrong, we separate from what he wants us to do. When people do what's right, what they do is exposed to God. Right or wrong, it's exposed to God. We come into the light and it's exposed. That's what we just read. John 3, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. When people do what's wrong, they're trying to hide those things. They're staying out of the light. They're going into darkness because they don't want people to see their deeds. They want to do those naughty things. They want to do those bad things. But still have all the benefits of being a Christian. I want to be a CEO of a company, but I don't want to run the company. You know, it doesn't make any sense, but that's where it is. Galatians 6, 9, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Are there going to be times where you're going to be able to do a lot of good? No. I can attest to this. There are times when I've been able to do a ton of good. There are times when I can't do that much good. Now, what I'm doing here is good because I'm helping uh, encourage others, helping to feed the sheep, reading the scriptures out loud. I mean, and anybody can do this. This isn't something that's an assignment that's given. You'll hear a lot of people that'll tell you, hey, nobody should be preaching the word unless they've been properly trained and everything. Well, that's fine. I understand that. But I'm not a pastor and I'm not a teacher. I'm just reading the word. And you don't have to be a teacher to teach. I'm not a teacher of auto mechanics, but I can teach somebody what I know. I'm not a teacher of the word, but I can teach somebody what I've learned and what I know and what's been shown to me. The goal is never to get tired of doing what we know is the right thing. Don't get tired of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. You don't give up. And then in Galatians 5, we have the fruits of the Spirit. In case anybody needs a reference, uh, what, are, what are the fruits of the Spirit? What should I be looking for? And that's it right there, Galatians 5, 22, 23. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Romans 12, 19, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And I've had to teach myself this. <clears throat> the army made me very aggressive. I had to teach myself. I don't need to go and get payback on anybody. I don't need to go and, and make sure this is settled properly. But let it go. On the day of judgment, God will deal with it. On that day, that final day of judgment, the white throne of judgment, God will deal with it. I would much rather those people repent and turn to the Lord and be saved. Yeah. 
What's the right thing to do? It's what God tells us. It's what God tells us. Isaiah 1, 17, 17, learn to do good. Notice it's not something that's instant or automatic. Learn to do good. Learn what the right thing is to do. Go to God's word and enter in prayer. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Here's another good thing to do. Proverbs 3, 5. And this is a good thing. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5 couldn't be more applicable today. We spend so much time trusting in ourselves or in other people or in our government or in our media. And we should not be trusting in any of that. Trust in the Lord. There's times now and there's bad times coming. We need to be putting our full faith and trust in him at all times. Because if when things get bad... All you'll have is your faith and trust in the Lord. And they'll mock you. Oh, look what your God's done now. You're, where's your God at now? This is what you're going to hear. If we get up in a situation, if by chance something happens in the future and we end up in a situation where we're in camps or anything like that, or they come and they arrest you and put you in jail for being a Christian and preaching, and people will tell you, where's your God now? Why isn't your God saving you now? You already know what the, the response is. You either say nothing just smile, put your head down and pray for him. Or you tell them, well, where was my Lord when Jesus was on the cross? Right there with him. He's right here with me. But you can't see him because your heart is too hard. Because your heart is too full of darkness. Your eyes are not open. But mine are. You stand in trust in the Lord. You stand in confidence in the truth. Now, more than ever, we need to put our trust in the Lord. With all the weird doctrines out there, with all the weird stuff people are coming up with, now more than ever, we need to put our trust in the Lord. Why? It's the right thing to do. Do the right thing. I'm going to end my scripture reading there. But it goes further. They've got some other ones mixed in here that don't really seem to go with it. But <clears throat> What do you know is the right thing to do? What do you know by God's word is the thing that you should do in any situation? One of the right things to do, and this is just something I'll set up as an example. In any situation that you experience, prayer is always the right thing to do. Always. In anything that you do throughout your day, pray, uh, uh, praise and thanksgiving to God is the right thing to do. In anything that you do, throughout your life, daily activity, whatever it is. Giving thanks is the right thing to do. Always the right thing to do. And amazingly enough, when you go look at the scriptures, the scriptures say, these are the things that please God. So if you know what the right thing is to do, do it. Give praise to God. Give thanks to God. Bless God. Bless others. Walk in the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5. Do the things you know make him happy. Walk in faith, for it is impossible to please God without faith. Trust in him in all things. These are the right things to do. We can do those. If we can establish those and ourselves in those, everything else comes easy. If we can learn to agree with God on all things, everything else is easy. Everything else is easy. What you're going through right now, and I'm speaking to each individual person and their individual issues, what you're going through right now, because I have my own, what you're going through right now is not, number one, not specific to you, because others around the world are suffering, just like that or worse. What's going on right now isn't something that was meant to destroy you, because in Christ, it's meant to build you up. God is making you better through these things. See... You don't learn to be an auto mechanic by somebody handing you a degree. You learn to be an auto mechanic by working on cars. You don't learn to be a, an aircraft repairer by riding in an aircraft. You learn to be an aircraft repairer by fixing the aircraft. You don't learn to be a faith-filled, trust-in-God, spirit-filled Christian by taking on a title or a name. 
You don't become a believer by just putting a sticker on your shirt saying, hello, I am a Christian. You have to go through the trials and tribulations associated with being a Christian. That's why Jesus said, don't save them out of it, save them through it. Protect them through it. That's why he told Peter, Peter, Satan seeks to sift you as wheat. Well, we're not going to run him off. But instead, I'm going to pray that you have the strength to endure. And Peter endured. Peter would not have gotten better if God would have removed him from the situation. Peter got better because God preserved him through the situation. Now, a lot of people... And I have to throw this in here because it's, it's a thing right now. A lot of people will take that understanding and say, oh, so we got to go through the tribulation. That's not what I'm saying. Again, there's certain things that are specific for other reasons and has nothing to do with this. Every day of your life, you will go through trials and tribulations. The physical pain you feel is a tri trial and tribulation. Hatred from other people is a trial and tribulation. Arguments, people talking about you behind your back, all these things, these are all trials and tribulations that you're going through. Some you know about, some you don't. These are the things the Lord brings you through, not out of. Because when you go through them, when you endure them, it creates those characteristics of a true born-again believer. It makes you something very unique and very special. That's why so many people sought to, like the angels and the prophets and that, sought to know more about this that was going on in this age of grace. About what this new creation was going to be. It's a people born, not for adversity, but of adversity. People born out of strife. People born out of trials. It's a very unique, one-of-a-kind people born from an age of common grace but being attacked on all sides for what they were doing. So you would think the grace, there would be no attacks, but it's worse. It's a very unique group of people because in 2,000 years of free grace to everybody, not everybody attained to the free grace. You would think when the doors are flung wide open and everybody has free access, that everybody would figure it out. That your, your least... Your, your least population would be the ones who got it wrong. But it's actually the other way around. See, when you give them what they want, only those who respect it. You give somebody a car, they're not going to respect the car. But you help them buy the car, it's a different story. Now they have ownership of it. Now it means something to them and they're going to take care of it. I, I, we, we're bad about this. People all over the world are bad about this. You give it to them, they don't care. We had a, a, a town in Iraq that, that we were taking gen a generator out there to run the whole town. And we were uh, helping them set stuff up so they could have power and everything. And the rebels would come through. Uh, I think it was at that time it was Hezbollah would come through. Uh, we had a couple of, ha some Hamas out there, but mainly it was Hezbollah. And they'd come through and they'd take the generators. And after three times, we're like, we're not giving you another one. So we made a deal with them. We said, okay, here's what we'll do. You guys build this platform. Y'all set up this little structure here so it has a cover over it. Let's get all the wires run and put everything back in here and get everything ready. Here's what we want from you. And we set up, because they had date palms, we said, well, we'll take this much dates and this kind of stuff. And so they gathered all this stuff together that they could afford. And we did a trade. Now they had ownership over it. We taught two of their guys how to work on it. We set the generator up. They fought Hezbollah off. When the Hezbollah came, they fought them off. They ran them off. That's our generator. You're not going to touch it. See, they have ownership of it now. It's giving it to them, it meant nothing to them. But when they had something invested in it, now it meant something to them. Now they were going to fight for it. We've got something invested in our salvation. Going through these trials and tribulations. Now, that's not to say we have ownership of it. We've got something invested in it. It means something to us. The rest of the people, you hand it to them. They don't respect it. God is handing out to anybody who believes, but not everybody's getting it. Not everybody respects it because it was just handed to them. When you have to go through some things, it's, it's not a way of earning it. You can't earn salvation. But when you go through some things, it gives you ownership over it. You're, you're, it's like it means more to you. And in this age of grace, only certain individuals have realized how important this is. 
So when they go through that stuff, it makes the salvation more to them. They want to cultivate it more. They want to work with it more. They want to do more. Through that process of sanctification, they realize just how important all this is and that it means everything. It literally, everything hinges on this. But the larger majority of people don't care. It was handed to them and they, they don't have any respect for it. See, Jesus did all the work. So the people are like, oh, cool. Well, I can do whatever I want. And that's not the case. To some of us, and, it, and it's a surprisingly small number, even after 2,000 years, some of us saw it and saw just how valuable this was. Even though we didn't earn it, even though we didn't fight for it, even though we did not did nothing to attain this or, or, or earn this or become worthy of this, we saw how valuable it was and it meant something to us because somebody else went through the effort. See, not everybody, not everybody's like that. I have an individual in my life that doesn't value things that I've given them. Dropped quite a bit of money on a couple items. And those items are falling apart and destitute now. When you give somebody something, it's one thing. When they understand what was given into it and what was done for this, it changes the value of it. Most people don't understand what Christ did for them. That's why they don't believe it correctly. Some of us do. And so we understand what he did for it. So it gives it great value. This is what leads us into doing what's right. And one of those things that we purchased, my wife uh, basically became an indentured servant to a friend. I helped her a few times, but we cleaned house to earn this thing, to in order a way to pay for this thing. But there was no value attached to it by the individual we gave it to, evidently. So, even though we can't earn that salvation, even though we can't do anything to become worthy of that salvation, we recognize what Christ did for it, and that makes it special to us. So, if somebody else does something for you, you recognize what that person did. There was a guy, oh, this was, this was all over the news, a guy that had gotten uh, stuck, and his truck broke. And he was hauling a camper, and there was a bunch of guys harassing him. He couldn't move the camper. It was because he was Hispanic. He couldn't move the camper, and they're harassing him. They're beating him up about it. Well, a group got in touch with him and went and took his truck and completely rebuilt his truck. That guy treats that truck like it's made of glass. He keeps it clean. He keeps it maintained. It means something to him because he knows what went into fixing it. Other guys, if you've ever watched the show Pit My Ride... Other guys would get that and within a week wreck, wreck the car that was fixed up for them. They didn't care. It didn't matter to them that somebody else put all that effort into it. It didn't matter that somebody else put their sweat into it. I, I did that with a tractor for somebody recently. And I spent weeks getting it set up and getting it going and all this stuff. I did what three men couldn't do in three years in two weeks and got it going and the person didn't it didn't mean anything to them even though that's what they wanted salvation was given to us by someone else's work it's up to us to pay attention to the work that person did so that we understand just how valuable it is because when we understand how valuable it is we take care of it more the problem we're dealing with today is so many people don't realize what was done for this. They don't realize that a man died on a cross for us and his blood was spilled all over the ground for us. It, what, he didn't do that for him. He did that for everyone else. Great value is attached to this thing we call salvation. It is important that we realize this. Those who have realized this are the ones who do what's right. The ones who hold on to this. The ones who fight for this. The ones who stand up for this because it means something to them. The other people, the millions upon millions over 2,000 years, upon millions, it didn't mean anything to them because somebody handed it to them. Here you go, free grace. Here you go, free salvation. The greatest gift God ever gave us was free salvation 
the worst thing God ever did for, to us was give us free salvation because most people don't understand what it is. They don't understand just how valuable this is. You give a man a million dollars and he'll blow it in a year. He earns that million dollars and he cultivates that and hangs on to it. People that win the lottery, if they win, you know, 90 million to 150 million, almost every single person that has done that in the history of the lottery is broken five years. They didn't earn that money. They were given that money. It meant nothing to them, so they didn't do anything with it. Do what's right. You know the right thing to do. Do what's right. I know there's people listening. <coughs> Excuse me. I know there are people listening that are on the other side of the aisle on this. You know the right thing to do. Do that. You know what was done for you. Don't treat it like a common thing. That's what that means in the Bible. How much more of a punishment do you think him worth that treads the son of God underfoot and treats the blood as a common thing? It is the most special thing. Our salvation is derived from this. And it behooves us to take care of it. How do we take care of it? Do the right thing. Walk in faith, trust in God. You guys see how this all comes together? It is so important to recognize, and this is where we, where we, others benefit from listening to us, when we explain just how valuable this is. That it's not just a coat you put on and take off. It's surgery. It's a heart transplant. What does the person do that has to go get a heart transplant and go through months of healing? They start taking care of it. It means something to them. It's something it's it's different. That's what it is for a true born again believer. Everything's different. It means something to them. It has substance. <clears throat> but to the rest of the world, it's just a story. That's what you get from most people. They tell you about a cool story, bro. But I believe what the preacher tells me. Okay. Don't blame him on that day if you find yourself on the wrong end of the judgment. Don't blame that preacher or that friend. Don't blame them, those people. Oh, you can only blame yourself because you didn't take the time to put value to this. You didn't take the time to pay attention to this. Do what's right. Always do what's right. What's the right thing to do? Acknowledge what this is and treat it as such. One of the first things you can do as a Christian is realize just how important what he did on the cross was for mankind. And it was for all mankind. And I don't think we realize just how important that act that was performed on that cross, that series of events that was started three, over 3,000 years prior, And it started a series of events that isn't going to end for two, th it, well, it was, wasn't going to end 2,000 years, 2,000 years ago. We're looking at the tail end of it right now. But had a 2,000 year fruition. And there's still another 2,000 years there. Actually, it's going to be 3,000, about 3,000 and about 3,000. And then it will all be done with. Major, major events in world history all culminating around this one act. Everything centers on that one moment, on that one piece of land, on that one cross stuck in that ground. Everything centered on that. So we do what's right. Why? Because it glorifies God. We do what's right because it's the right thing to do. We do what's right because it's our God's will. And it should be our will to do the right thing. So now what do we do? We have to analyze and find out what the right thing is to do in every situation. And do those things. And you know what that causes you to do? This is what caused me to do. Slow down. Caused me to slow down and take a look. Because if I just plow through it, I miss a lot of stuff. 
But if I slow down and look at it, I realize what's really going on. A great example of that, just plowing through and not knowing, is when I was um, discharged from Fort Drum and we were coming back. It took us three days to get out of the state of New York because a major blizzard hit the day we were unpacking the van. They shut down a part of a highway coming out of Buffalo. And it was a part of the highway we were supposed to take. We had to take a major detour. Well, the highway got so slick that people slid off on the shoulders. Well, the plows finally got there and they started plowing. All of a sudden, the ra they called on the radio and told all the plows, stop where you're at. Everybody shut down because they realized they were burying cars. They buried 153 cars on that road. 17 people died. Because once the car's buried, the vehicle can't get air and it can't expel O2. Well, everybody was sleeping in their cars with the heat on, waiting for the plows to come. And they died in their sleep. See, when you plow through, you don't see what's going on. When you plow through and don't examine and make sure everything's the way it's supposed to be, you miss certain things. Men, women, and children died on that road that night. Because people just plowed through. Who do we hurt uh, aside from ourselves when we just plow through? Instead, let us slow down and examine. And this is the lesson he's taught me. Slow down. Examine what's going on. Look at what the details are. Because that could change drastically the decision you make concerning that one particular thing. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory. To lift you up and sing praises unto your holy name. To give thanks to you for this wonderful word that tells us the truth. Your truth. That tells us what the right thing is to do. And that how important it is to stop, smell the roses. Stop and look and do the right thing. To stop and analyze. Should I be involved in this? Should I not? What's the right thing to do to this? And what's the wrong thing to do? To stop and realize how important it is, how vitally important it is that we acknowledge what Christ did on the cross for all of mankind and that everything in history hinges on that one moment, that three hour time frame where the weight of the sins of the world, past, present, and future, sat on his shoulders. And when it was finished, and he declared it was finished. His spirit left him. The future of mankind rested right there. Father, make us to do what's right. Make us to do what's right in your eyes. Help us to understand what is right in our individual lives, in our individual experiences, what is right in our eyes. Let us not avoid the bad things. Let us not avoid the trials. Instead, let us walk through them with confidence, in truth, knowing that's the right thing to do. Let us pray to you and ask for strength and perseverance. Let us walk in truth and in trust in you. These are all the right things to do. Though we mess things up, though we get things wrong, though we make mistakes, let us always try to find the right thing to do and do our best to do it. And you bless us through the rest of it and help us attain more through a sanctification that day of redemption. The kingdom of heaven rising in our hearts the kingdom of heaven that doesn't come with observation. So many people seem to miss that scripture. Father, make us to be a blessing to you and as good emissaries here. Make us, those of us that have been given to feed the sheep, make us to feed the sheep with good food. With good food from your word. Make us to all be blessed and to bless each other spiritually. And make us to bless you with the, the, the fruit of our lips, our, our words our thanksgiving and our blessings and our praise. Make us to bless you with our hearts, good thoughts, going the right way, caring for others and caring about your word. And make us to bless you with your actions, with our actions, sorry. The things that we do, doing the right thing. Thank you, Father, for giving us this. Thank you for opening our eyes to this. Thank you for these inspirations you've been giving me to cover in these videos. I know not all of them are popular. I know they're not, not all of them are popular. I know I don't get the point across perfectly every time. Some people don't understand what I'm saying, but I'm doing what I can with what I have. My hope is that everyone gets blessed by hearing this, whether it's through conviction or whether it's through confirmation. Everyone becomes blessed through what we're doing here. 
because I know that's the right thing to do. And I know that's something that glorifies you. And that's my goal is to glorify you in all these things. I pray that we're all able to do that in whatever we're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, we bless you and praise you, honor you and glorify you. In Jesus' name, we thank you for your mercy and your grace and your great gift of salvation that you provided for us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you guys for joining me for daily prayer. It's hard to do what's right sometimes. It's hard to make the right decision. I mean, we may be standing right in the middle of a gauntlet, being hit on every side, top and bottom. But when we do the right thing, God always blesses it. When we do the right thing, the thing we know is right. I'm not talking about you know, supposing or, or not knowing what we know is right. When we do the right thing, we walk in alignment with the will of our God. And that is a blessing to us, to him. Let us always try to find what the right thing is to do. And if we don't know, ask. Let us always try to discover what would please God. If we don't know, we ask. Let us always walk that narrow path as best we can and put our trust in God and our, in our Lord Jesus to keep us on the path. I love you guys. I bless you all in Jesus' name. I'll see you in the next video.